So from the 13th chapter of Romans, starting with verse 8, listen to the word of God for you. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, whatever other command there may be, are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not carousing in drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy, but rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I was, I was sitting down to write in a Starbucks on Friday morning, and their radio was playing a non-stop stream of Disney love songs. <laughs> love is an open door. Can you feel the love tonight? Beauty and the Beast, Rainbow Connection, and on and on. Love song after love song. As I'm sipping my coffee, wondering how to possibly start a sermon on love, and you'll never guess what dawned on me that morning. The scriptures are a non-stop stream of love songs. They're love songs of God and creation, God and humanity, humanity and sin. Yeah, scripture also sings of our sordid love affair with sin, falsehood, power, idols. And ultimately, the song of God and the Christ the song of reconciliation and redemption, which is really just a reprise of God's love song for all of creation. For Paul, the task of the church is to respond in kind with our lives and our loyalty, letting our lives become a love song of gratitude for grace, verses which sing of God's mercy for us and a catchy chorus extolling love for our neighbors. Paul's choice of wording, inviting the church into this song, seems a bit off-putting to ears who are more accustomed to Disney. Paul reminds us that we are commanded to love one another, which, to the Disney connoisseur, clearly breaks the genie's rule about not wishing for love in Aladdin. You can't force someone to love against their will. Now, Paul Ochtemeyer remarks that such a command will either lead to frustration since we're being asked to do something we cannot do, namely to love a person we find unlovely, or it will lead to sham and hypocrisy when we pretend to love someone we really do not love at all. Well, to be fair to God, I will remind us again of the love affair between humans and sin, which has, as Octomire also points out, perverted and limited our understanding of what love is. See, if we dilute our definition of love to the Disney version, then it has to do with that feeling that comes over us when an attractive member of the opposite sex comes into view. Now, rather than destroying the nostalgia of Disney by dissecting all their problematic portrayals of love, gender roles, and human sexuality, I will suffice it to agree with Octomire that that is not what the New Testament means by love. That God loves us hardly means that God gets a warm feeling inside when God thinks of us. See, we know God loves us not because of the way God feels about us, but because of what God has done for us. Therein lies one problem with oversimplifying the scriptures as a bunch of love songs. Right? We must rescue love from the shallow sentimentality of warm fuzzies, late night cuddles, and empty promises. God's love song elevates the game. 
considerably. Recall the chorus from John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son for our redemption. So we're being called to respond to God's love with more than lyrics and lip service, but with action. The choreography of compassion following the footwork of the Lord of the dance. We are, after all, the hands and feet of Christ not the mouthpiece. What we do matters more than what we say. And so it's because God cares so much about what we do that God initially gave the law and the commandments in the first place. And so many of these, however, are voiced in the negative, stating what we are not to do. And while there are hundreds upon hundreds of these laws and commands rather explicitly laid out, there's still the potential justification of sinful behavior by claiming that scripture did not explicitly say not to do something, like bury our enemies up to their necks in macaroni and cheese, pour honey on their head, and release fire ants. Nowhere in scripture does it tell us not to do that. Now Jesus wisely finds a way to snuff out this silliness, and Paul echoes his wisdom by giving us one law, voiced in the positive by which we can fulfill and accomplish all the others. One thing which we can do that will keep us from doing all of the many things God doesn't want us doing. Love one another. So rather than racking our brains through hundreds of thou shalt nots, trying to recall if there's any law against burying someone in pasta, we now have but one question to ask. Is it loving? No. No, it isn't. Don't do that. Love is a call to action, and it's a calling which I believe is crucial to our identity as the church in the world. To understand the importance of this calling, one need look no further than the newspaper headlines and the evening news and the overwhelming unloveliness of the world at times. It feels like we're drowning in hate and violence and anger and division. Can you see the dire need for the gospel, for good news amidst this sea of bad news. So in classic architecture, the center of the church, stretching from the entry to the front chancel, was called the nave, which is Latin for ship, and whose vaulted ceiling in many cases was modeled to look like a ship turned upside down. And it's also believed that this was intentionally done to represent the early Christian symbol of the church as a ship, the Ark of Noah, holding the future of God's kingdom safe amidst the flood of mortal ills prevailing. Love is our calling, but it's also our rescue. Our calling to climb on board the only ship which will not be sunk. But first, we must let go of the wreckage to which we cling. We must recognize that the broken scraps of this world will not save us, but that's not always easy. Imagine a boat on a dark and stormy night tossed by a wave that breaks the boat to splinters. The world is instantly transformed for those on board, reduced to wind and waves and darkness. People are drowning and they desperately latch on to whatever they can find floating by. And these broken scraps become their lifeline. They entrust these broken scraps with their life as the waves crash violently all around. And out of the darkness comes a voice saying, let go. In the darkness, they can't see where the voice is coming from. Their only sensation is the wearying wash of sea spray and their white knuckled grasp upon their broken scrap of waterlogged wreckage. Let go. No way. That sounds like a calling to certain death. I imagine that this is what Jesus' invitation to the kingdom of God sounds like to a lot of people. And it doesn't help that Jesus also said things like, whoever wishes to save their life must lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. What was he really talking about? 
Jesus is crying out to sojourners in the sea of sin from aboard a rescue boat. The life he is asking them to let go of is a scrap of wreckage that in the blinding darkness of sin, they have come to equate with life. That's the difficult task God faces, inviting sinners who are blind and scared and drowning to let go. How do you convince someone to trust in a boat that they cannot see? How do you convince them to let go in faith when the broken scrap to which they cling is so sure and certain? How do you do that? The answer is of great importance because it shapes the choreography of our calling. Well, how does God ultimately do it? That's what the gospel is all about. God does it by loving us. Not through intimidation or insult, but by grace and mercy. The very first love song of scripture tells of the spirit of God which hovers over chaotic waters and gently calls creation into being. Just so God hovers over sinners, singing over and again to us the wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, gentle words, loving words, comforting words, healing words, sinner list to the loving call. Those with whom you share your broken scrap of wreckage might sing other lyrics, hateful words, fearful words, belittling words, insulting words, amounting little more than don't let go, you idiot. This is all there is. Cling tighter, fight harder for your position on this scrap of wreckage. Our calling as the church is to help God's words echo through the night. It's a difficult task to be sure, and we will face much resistance. We will even face the temptation to join our voices to the shouts of sin. Maybe if I go overboard just a little bit, I could help the people down there better. But you'll never be able to insult and intimidate anyone into trusting God. Only love can do that. As the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. In just a few moments, we'll say a prayer inviting God's spirit to preside over the Lord's table, the very same spirit who makes its home in the hope which hovers over the waters of chaos. And as we approach this table, we will be asked by God to let go of the broken scraps to which we cling so that we might have room in our hands to take hold of an entirely different kind of broken scrap. God offers us the broken body of Christ, which can only lead us to safety and unity and peace and life if we're willing to let go of the wreckage of this world to take hold of God's salvation. This is our calling, O oh church, to stand on board with God and compassionately invite sinners to let go of the wreckage of this world and learn to love one another. Amen.